In the first part of the video, I've talked about how we can do the first and second steps of the simplex algorithm, which are um, converting the LP model into a standard form and then obtaining a BFS. In this video, I'm going to talk about the remaining steps in the simplex algorithm until we get the optimal solution. So let's start. In the first video, we have obtained a BFS from the standard form. Now we are going to do step three, asking the question, is the current BFS optimal or not? If not, we are going to step four, obtaining an adjacent BFS, and step five, performing errors to find the new BFS, and then go back to step three to ask, is the new BFS optimal? This is the BFS that we've got from step two in the previous video. And this is based on the problem of Dakota furniture, which the objective function is to maximize the revenue. So um, if we rearrange the row zero by um, moving all the variables to the right hand side, as we usually write objective functions. So this row zero means Z equals 60X1 plus 30x2 plus 20x3 plus 0. So the last 0 is this constant. At this moment, in this BFS, x1, x2, and x3, they are all non-basic variables, such that their values are all 0. So now if you think about this, is there any way to increase the z? Remember that in this problem, the objective is maximization. So the answer is yes. If you think about it, if you increase x1 from 0 to something, you will get the revenue of $60, right? So for each x1 that you produce, you will get the profit of, sorry, the revenue of $60. So the more x1 you produce, the higher revenue that you obtain. At this moment, again, x1 is 0 because in this solution, x1, x2, x3 they are all non-basic variables. So how to spot this uh, opportunity in our table? So if we have a maximization problem, and then you see in row 0, there are variables with the coefficient um, value negative, it means that your current solution is not optimal yet. So we have here minus 60, minus 30, minus 20. If at least you see one variable with negative coefficient in a maximization problem, it means that your current BFS is not optimal. So the answer for step three is that this BFS is not optimal. From the previous step, we know that the basic feasible solution that we have currently is not optimal. And then from our discussion, we also know that uh, among x1, x2, and x3, it seems that the best thing to do is try to push x1 uh, with the value as large as possible. Because each x1 that we produce will contribute to the revenue $60. So it's the highest compared to x2 and x3. So in other words, we will try to make x1 to become basic variable in the next um, step. Um, and then how we choose x1 by looking at who has the most negative coefficients in row 0, which in the maximization case, this is the most profitable or the best variable that we can try to push the value as large as possible. So here we decide that x1 would become an entering variable. From non-basic enters to become basic variable. But surely there is a consequence from producing nothing, I mean producing no desks at all, and now you decide to produce as many desks as possible. Of course, there should be an impact of this, right? So we will not consider x2 and x3 at this moment because we will keep them as 
non-basic variables. So nothing changed. We still don't produce table. We still don't produce chair. But now let's see the impact of increasing X1. As I've said before, from producing zero desk to producing non-zero desk means that you are now going to produce one, two, three, four, and or as many as possible. Of course, the amount of unused resources will change, right? In the current solution, you don't produce anything. So you have unused um, resource one, you have unused resource two, resource three and resource four. However, now you decide that you're going to produce desk. Of course, the number of unused resources will change and should change. How do we know how much each of the resources changes? Well, let's try to look at each of the row in this table. So here you can see 8x1 plus s1 equals 48. Because again, we ignore x to x3 because they are still non-basic variable. We still decide we're not going to produce table and chair at this step, so we can just ignore them and just look at the variables that we're interested at. X1, which is uh, the desk that we are going to produce, and S1 is the number of unused resource one that we have, which will be affected by our decision to produce more desks. And then from the second row, we get this equation, 4X1 plus S2 equals 20, and then this is from the third row or third equation. And then finally, this is the last one. You don't have x1, it means you can say zero times x1. And then from here, you can um, move all uh, the axes to the other side. So the left-hand side only the slacks. So now s1 equals 48 minus 8x1, s2 equals 20 minus 4x1, and so on. And you know that in the formulation, you've already said the sign restrictions that all of the slack variables, they must be greater than or equals to zero. So now you can um, state that 48 minus 8x1 must be greater than zero. From the second equation, 20 minus 4x1 must be greater than or equals to zero and so on. Such that now you can say from the first equation, you get the requirement that x1 must be less than or equals to six, right? Because 48 minus 8x1 greater than or equals to zero, you move 8x1 to the other side and then divide both sides by eight, you get this requirement. From the second equation, you get the requirements x1 must be less than or equal to five. From the third, you get x1 less than or equals to four. And then from the fifth, x1 can be whatever, right? Because five here is already greater than or equals to zero. It's not affected by x1 that you produce. So from the last equation, you can say x1 can be whatever. Now, based on this all requirements, you can say that to keep the slack variables greater than or equals to zero, you need to have x1 less than or equals to four. It means that um, although you want to produce desk as many as possible as you want, the available resources um, limit you to produce four desks at most. So um, again, this may be interpreted as saying that the variable x1 may be increased from zero to four at most, such that all current basic variables are still greater than or equals to zero. So s1, s2, s3, s4, there are currently basic variables. If we increase x1 from zero to four, you can keep all those slack variables greater than or equals to zero. What we did in the previous slide may be obtained by something called ratio test. So we don't need to write down the equations, but we can just simply do the ratio test. 
So the ratio test compute this ratio, the ratio of the right hand side divided by the coefficients of the column in the entering variable. So x1 is our entering variable. So you look at the coefficient in this column and then perform the ratio test. For the first equation, the ratio is 48, the right hand side, divided by 8, the ratio of the column of the entering variable. And then the second, you obtain the ratio 20 divided by 4 equals 5. And then the third one, 8 divided by 2 equals 4. And then for the last one, anything divided by 0 or negative number, the result is none. There is no ratio for such case. So see, this is exactly the same with the previous slide where we write down all the equations but here you can do it in a more um, in a simpler way i will say and then you pick the smallest ratio so for the ratio test you always pick the smallest one and then from here you know that uh, that row is the winner of the ratio test in other words s3 will become the living variable S3 will leave the basic variable, and then in the next step, S3 will become non-basic variable. So that's the intersection between the entering variable X1 and the leaving variable S3. So to summarize the step four, X1 becomes the entering variable because it has the most negative coefficient in row zero. And this is the case because uh, this problem is a maximization. So you pick the most negative coefficient in row zero and the corresponding vari variable becomes entering variable. And the leaving variable is the one with the smallest ratio test. And in this case, it was, sorry, it was S3. So S3 will leave the basic variable and becomes non-basic variable. In step five, we are going to perform elementary row operation such that the goal is from the table that is shown to become something like this, in which X1 will have a canonical form. Only the place of the intersection between entering and leaving variable, it will have the coefficient of one. So the row three here will become uh, will have the coefficient one for x1 but for all other rows we will have the coefficient of zero so we will do the elementary row operation to achieve this thing so in other words we will have x1 uh, having this coefficient at the beginning minus 68420 to become 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So again, this is one because it is the intersection between the entering variable and the leaving variable. Now let's perform the arrows, elementary row operations with the third row is our pivot row. Um, th that is called pivot row because our purpose is from this table shown on your screen. We are going to change it to become something like this. You see that the column X1 becomes 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0. So this 1 appears on the pivot row. Okay, so let's start. How can we change something from the value 2 in the red circle here to become 1? One thing that we can do is that multiply the entire row with a half. So this is called row operation because we are, if we do something, then we apply that thing to the entire row. So we multiply the old row three with a half, the entire row, and then we obtain this new row. So see that uh, you multiply all the coefficients and then all the constants up to the right-hand side. So here, eight times a half becomes four in the new table. For the other rows, again, we try to um, convert something like minus 60 here to become zero. So to do that, you can um, try that minus 60 to become zero means that minus 60, you need to add 60 to become zero, right? So how can we do that? 
We can do that by saying that we have the old row 0, which is six, minus 60, plus 60 times this, the pivot, right? So the result that you see in the new table equals the old row 0 times 60 of the row 3. Okay, so you do this for the entire row. So let me give you an example. The right hand side is 0. 0 times 60, sorry, 0 plus 60 times 4 equals 240. Another example here, this is S3, the coefficient is 0. So the old row, 0, the value is 0 plus 60 times a half. So the new value becomes 30. For the row 1, um, you are going to convert something 8 here to become 0. So what you can do is the old row 1 minus 8 times the new, the new row 3. You do that for the entire row. And then you do the same similar thing for row 2 and row 4 now that you get the new table. Now you see that the basic variables changes from S1, S2, S3, S4 in the table above to become S1, S2, X1, S4. So we successfully enter X1 to the basic variable and S3 now is already leaving the basic variable to become non-basic variable. We have finished step five and according to the algorithm, we are going back to step three means we are going to check again, is the current BFS optimal or not? For the maximization case in this problem, it is not optimal because you see that in the row zero, you still have a variable with a negative coefficient. In this case, it is x3 with the coefficient minus five. So the answer is no, this BFS is not optimal. However, notice that the z value has improved. In our first BFS, the Z value is 0. Now it has improved to 240. So in step 4, again, we are going to determine the entering variable and the leaving variable. The entering variable from step 3, we know it is X3 going to enter the basic variable because it has the most negative coefficient in row 0. And for the leaving variable, as usual, we are going to do ratio test. The right hand side divided by the coefficient of the column of this entering variable. 60 divided by minus 1, the result is none. We don't do ratio test with the negative or 0, so the result is none. The second row, the ratio is 8. The third row, the ratio is 16. The last one is also none because it is divided by 0. Among 8 and 16, the smallest one is 8, so this row um, wins the ratio test. And then that is the um, intersection between the entering and the leaving variable. So the leaving variable is S2. So let's do the arrows again now with the purpose that the column X3 becomes like this, 0 in all places except in the place where uh, it is the intersection between our entering variable x3 and leaving variable s2. So same as before, first we're looking at our pivot row and see how we can convert that to become like this. So originally the value in the circle is 0.5. We want to make it becomes 1 in the table below. So we can do multiply the entire old row by 1 over 0.5. Or in other words, you multiply everything in the old row with 2. So you uh, 2 times 0.5 become 1, and then the entire row becomes like this. So right-hand side 4, 4 times 2 becomes 8. For the other row, for example, row 0, you may obtain the new row 0 by doing this the old row 0 
plus 5 times new row 2. So the old row 0, let's say here in this position, minus 5, plus 5 times 1, the new value becomes 0. The old value of row 0, 240, plus 5 times 8, becomes 280. And then for the row 1, you can obtain the new row 1 by using the old row 1 plus 1 times new row 2. And then this is for the row 3. And then uh, finally for row 4, nothing changes actually for row 4 because originally it was 0. And then in the new table, uh, we want it to become 0, to become still 0. So nothing changes for row 4. So that is our new BFS. And then you see now X3 enters the basic variable. And then we already successfully kick out select 2. Notice that the Z value increases again from 240 to 280, but X1 decreases from 4 to 2. X3 increases from 0. Here, X3 is non-basic, so it's 0. It increases to become 8. So it means that in this step, we try to produce x1 as many as possible. But uh, of course, according to the availability of resources, producing x1 as many as possible is not the optimal solution. Um, x1 has the highest price, but when we consider the resources that we have, apparently it is more um, profitable if we produce less x1, but we produce more x3, such that we can use uh, our resources more efficiently. Now we go back to step three to check, is the table that we have in our previous slide, is it optimal or not? For the maximization case, this is already optimal because in the row zero, you see there is no coefficient with negative value. So this solution is optimal for the Dakota problem. So uh, for Dakota problem, it should produce two desks, zero, ch zero tables, sorry, zero tables because x2 is a non-basic variable, and then produce eight chairs. The total revenue from this optimal solution is $280. So this is the end of this video, but I have some questions to check your understanding in a separate video. So see you in that one. Thank you.